it's really, really exciting to be having this conversation. I personally grew up playing on bales of silage in the heart of uh, dairy farmland in Tipperary. Um, so to, to be having this conversation to kickstart the role that the conversation around the role that agriculture and land use plays in climate action and to try and break down this idea that farmers and climate activists and policy makers need to be pushed against each other is really exciting. Um, I'm just going to share with you a quick slide um, from a piece of research that came out today uh, that Friends of the Earth, one of the Stop Climate Chaos members, um, commissioned which showed, if I'm going to get to slide two now, showed, and you can see here, um, this is the research that we did and, and the results broken down between urban and rural. And we can see that this was a, a nationally representative survey. 73% um, uh, across the country uh, agreed that emissions from agriculture need to be reduced by supporting a move to more sustainable farming. But what's really interesting is uh, the fact that while 79% in urban and suburban areas uh, agreed, also 66% in rural um, and rural town areas uh, agreed with that too. So that's, it's really great to kind of like set the context for our, our conversation today that there is um, widespread agreement that we need to be looking more at uh, sustainable farming. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so uh, what's the context? So the context for this, is that there's government talks happening um, and there's been a lot of debate about what level of annual emissions reduction Ireland needs to commit to over the lifetime of the next government and beyond. Um, and there seems to be an emerging consensus on the need for emissions reductions of at least 7% per year on average. And there's been lots of talk about what that might look like for Ireland's transport and energy and buildings. But there's been not a lot of public debate or media coverage about what the agricultural and land use sectors need to do to contribute to this minimum average 7% reductions in emissions. Um, and as we know, emissions from the agricultural sector account for over 30% of Ireland's overall greenhouse gas emissions and half of all non-ETS emissions. So the questions that we're going to be asking today are things like, what does this scale of emissions mitigation mean for agriculture and land use more generally? Um, questions like, does it actually necessarily mean a reduction in the national herd size? That big question that always gets asked when we talk about agriculture and climate. Um, and then things like, what about the role that forestry, hedgerows, wetland restoration and soils can make in absorbing carbon? What we will not be doing is prescribing a one size fits all solution. Um, what we'll be doing is outline the climate science, the policy imperatives, um, and look at the need to integrate farm incomes and biodiversity into the range of solutions that are possible. Um, and the goal is really, really to open up um, dialogue and a space for that conversation. We want um, climate people and farmers to be talking to each other. Um, so yeah, so that, that's it. What are we thinking about how farmers who are the custodians of the land and climate activists, how we can start talking about how we really reduce emissions in a way that's fair for farmers and good for the land um, and biodiversity. So um, to explore these questions, we have three great women panelists. Um, and I'm first going to go to Saiva O'Neill, who's the Stop Climate Chaos Policy Advisor. And she has prepared um, slides on the latest climate science around agriculture and climate action. So, Saif, I will let you take it away. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, and it's lovely to see so many people here. It's very exciting. I'm just going to go straight to my uh, screen share. I hope you can all see that. Is that working OK? You can see my... You can see my slides. Can you, Anya, can you just let me know? You can see them. Great. OK, so um, I'm going to... Set them to, to slideshow, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of high level policy and the drivers behind Ireland's agricultural emissions. Um, but just to begin with, the reason I suppose that we're, we're doing this webinar is that it, it's part of the work that we have been doing as a coalition with some other civil society organisations in the lead up to the general election and then subsequent to the general election in our conversations and dialogue with the political parties that might be in a position to form a government and we have reached out to all the political parties 
and spoken with many of them on an uh, ongoing basis about different aspects of climate policy. And there's no doubt but that this is a very important opportunity in Irish uh, policy, in Irish climate policy. We're looking at a potential step change in climate ambition and that's going to have implications for every part of the economy. And what we were looking for as part of the One Future campaign is a, an approach to agriculture that uh, sort of linked the impacts of bad agricultural practices and policies on the climate with uh, policies relating to biodiversity and nature conservation. So we were looking for measures um, in advance of the election and since the election that support rural livelihoods, but at the same time reduce agricultural pollution and emissions. So we're you know, looking at different ways of doing that, developing different policy measures that uh, implement existing directives on water quality that would place limits, for example, on nitrogen fertilizers and obviously reducing pesticides. And on the positive side of it, you know, rethinking our approach to land use so that we are reconnecting with nature and diversifying our agricultural systems so that we can be more food secure and at the same time more resilient and uh, allowing biodiversity to thrive. But the big picture, of course, is the global climate problem. And we are uh, facing into a very serious climate breakdown. The number of years that we have left to prevent very dangerous global warming is rapidly diminishing. And the critical point I wanted to make here is that Ireland signed up to the Paris Agreement. We were uh, parties to the agreement. We ratified the agreement in 2016. And under the Paris Agreement, we committed to producing a nationally determined contribution, which is, if you like, our climate plan. And not only that, but the Paris Agreement makes it clear that each party successive, so we have to do this um, every five years, will progress in ambition so that it becomes more ambitious over time. And that each plan we present has to reflect the highest possible ambition. So that's if you like, the, the contribution we need to make towards implementing Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, which is the one that sets the temperature goal of avoiding dangerous climate change, holding global warming below two degrees, and uh, pursuing uh, the 1.5 degree target. And since the Paris Agreement was ratified, of course, the latest IPCC science is telling us that even 1.5 degrees of warming is potentially very dangerous. Now, the critical point here is that translating those temperature goals and looking at the obligations we have in international climate law gives us, if you like, uh, a carbon budget, a range of emission uh, well, it's a limited range, depending on how much risk you're prepared to take with, with your emissions and with uh, global warming. A, a range of emission limits, essentially, that can be equitably shared out amongst developed countries, because it isn't just that we divvy out the emission budget on a, say, per capita basis. It's very clear in the Paris Agreement and in international law that developed countries are expected to take the lead. That the agreement, and you can see there in Article 2.2 .2 at the bottom of the screen, is supposed to reflect equity and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. And while that might seem very abstract and remote, it is actually critical to understanding why we need to take action in every sector of our economy and that no one area can be exempt from effort. So when we're talking about uh, emissions on the land use side, as Anya explained, we're familiar with the debates about energy, renewables and microgeneration and retrofitting and public transport, active travel and all of that. On the land use side, it's a little bit more tricky because on the land use side, we have both emissions and removals. And removals, if you like, are those parts of the the kind of natural carbon cycle where carbon is actually absorbed from the atmosphere and put back into plants or trees or wood or peat or and there's, there's other types as well. But at the same time, the damage we're doing and the interaction we have with our land through various activities, including agriculture, but not only agriculture, uh, is leading to emissions and losses as well. And the primary source of emissions in Ireland would be from peatlands and from grasslands, actually. These would be kind of organic peaty soils where there is drainage happening. 
Nitrous oxides on the, on the land generate emissions as well, and these would be the application of fertilizers and the sort of various chemical reactions that take place. And then another big source of emissions is, of course, methane from ruminant livestock. And methane is a much more potent gas than carbon dioxide, as is nitrous oxide. And there's been a lot of debate about that, which I'll come to in a moment. Of course, deforestation is another source of uh, emissions because you might have lots of carbon stored in the trees, but once you chop it down and convert into other uh, land uses like agriculture or you burn the trees, you're actually emitting rather than capturing carbon. But of course, it, it could be a cycle. And depending on the time frame that you're speaking about, you could have a, situ a situation in theory where emissions are captured eventually by various uh, positive sequestration uh, events. But with the kinds of speed and the accelerating impacts of human activity on the environment, nature simply doesn't have a chance to catch up with the emissions and reabsorb that carbon. And the other problem is, of course, that the degradation of many ecosystems is interesting interfering with the ability of plants to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. So it's all very complicated and unfortunately the situation is very serious indeed and we need to take radical steps. So what are the trends in Ireland? Now these graphs here, I have to apologise in that they're slightly abstract, but the point I wanted to get to is that while, um, and you can see from the first graph on the left here, while emissions from agriculture uh, since 1990 were largely, apart from a brief increase between 1990 and 1995, uh, were increasing uh, somewhat, then they were sharply decreasing in line with various EU policies that encouraged extensification. And these uh, uh, emissions came down quite dramatically, in fact, and only started to increase again um, once it was clear that the milk quota was abolished. And that led to a kind of shift in uh, agricultural practices and uh, an increase in the dairy herd uh, all over again after a steep decline. So as you can see from the top right uh, graph there, we have very high rates of emissions per capita of the three gases that matter here. Now, it's not really carbon dioxide that matters. So it matters in the overall climate context, but in relation to land use, there's very small amounts of carbon dioxide. The big gases are nitrous oxide and methane, and we emit way more per capita than the EU average. And the bottom graph there shows you the um, difference between current emissions and 1990 emissions. So under the original framework convention on climate change, countries committed to reducing their overall emissions below 1990 levels. And as you can see from the little blue arrow here and Ireland sticking out there above the pink line, meaning that we haven't yet even managed to reduce our emissions below 1990 levels. So we're way off target in a range of areas. So the critical thing is that um, Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions, as we know from all the other debates we've been having over the last few months, these webinars and in climate politics and policy generally, that Ireland's emissions generally are not on track with what's required to meet our EU and international climate obligations. And again, this graph is a little bit difficult to make sense of when we're going through it really quickly, but it tells us that our emission profile is simply not consistent with, with the Paris Agreement and with the IPCC uh, 1.5 and 2 degree targets. So the yellow line there shows you the trajectory we should be on if we were heading towards the 1.5 degree carbon budget. But in fact, the blue line is where we're at and we're way above what we should be. And there are lots of different conversations to be had about the different sectors and how they've contributed to that failed target. But the critical thing is on the agriculture side, we have seen an increase in emissions. And unlike many countries, instead of having net removals, in other words, for many European countries, their forestry counts as quite a significant offset against their agricultural emissions. So they have net removals when you balance the two numbers out. But in our case, we have net emissions. And this is primarily because of our agricultural policies, that the policy is towards increasing production and it's oriented towards producing animal derived foods for export, as is promoted by Borbia. And they've been doing that very successfully. So much so they're reaching into even developing countries with milk products. Now, under the European uh, Union emission, uh, emission 
sorry, effort sharing decision and the, the climate governance regulations applying to 2030, we committed to reducing our emissions of uh, non-ETS emissions, uh, which would include all the, the, the agricultural emissions by 30%. Um, but unfortunately, we are not uh, on track to meet that target. And obviously, there will be some kind of a blip, you know, with what's been happening over the last few months. But that won't really affect agricultural emissions. It will affect the transport ones and very slight change in energy emissions. Um, so we have negotiated, because of this rather challenging target, some very generous flexibility flexibilities from the European Union that acknowledges the, the role of agriculture in the Irish economy and the difficulties in making kind of structural changes to uh, the, the livestock sector. So in a sense that argument has been had with the European Commission and won. Our other partners in the European Union have acknowledged that we have a slightly unique profile and they've given us flexibilities that no other member state has uh, of up to 45 million tonnes, that should have say million tonnes of uh, carbon dioxide equivalents. But the problem is that emissions are still increasing rather than decreasing. And I just wanted to highlight the sort of sort of series of policies there on the left hand side of the slide that have essentially led up to this situation. Because it's not just that we have had no action to stop emissions growing. We've had policies that are actively encouraging emissions growth. So firstly, we have the national policy position on climate change from 2014. And that, I won't go into it in detail, created a very vague aspiration for uh, climate neutrality for the agriculture and land use sectors. And critically, in doing so, it allowed all of the land use removals to offset agriculture's emissions. Because in theory, we could be using our forestry and any kind of wetland restoration projects, for example, to offset emissions from energy or transport. But we decided in 2014 to uh, allocate those removals solely towards agriculture's emissions. And that policy position is reflected in the Climate Act, which has then been challenged in the courts because of the uh, inadequate national mitigation plan that arose from it. And essentially, we had a series of policies then emanating from the Department of Agriculture in consult, well, they originated originally with the agri-food industry and then uh, adopted essentially by government as strategies to develop the agri-food sector. And these have had the effect of driving up emissions uh, on the dairy side, particularly. And despite the fact that the Joint Rectus Committee in 2019 and subsequently the Climate Action Plan a couple of months later set out some interesting policies based on the Chagask uh, sort of um, marginal abatement curve, essentially a series of measures that Chagask developed to reduce emissions from agriculture. These are all entirely voluntary. So we have a situation where there is no legally mandated uh, restriction on the growth of animal numbers or the applications of uh, nitrogen, you know, within the, the, the limits that are set out in the derogation of the, the, the nit nitrates directive. And that has created, uh, to say free for all would be possibly an exaggeration, but it certainly contributed to the uh, growth in the dairy herd and the increased emissions that inevitably come from that. So now let's talk about methane. So there's been a lot of debate. I won't go into all the detail here because these slides will be available and you can have a look at them later. But essentially the, the really important point here is that methane is more potent than carbon dioxide, but it stays for less uh, time in the atmosphere. So it acts as a kind of a sharp pulse of global warming rather than a cumulative stock of emissions. So in order to capture the role of methane in the atmospheric, uh, uh, the, the impact it has on the atmosphere, uh, some scientists in Oxford have developed a slightly different metric to try to capture this flow effect of methane over time. And um, the important thing is that while, while it's a very helpful way of understanding the real climatic impact of any policies to either increase or reduce methane, and the important thing is that under the IPCC accounting rules, Ireland is still obliged to follow the same rules as everyone else. So we can't just rewrite the accounting rules for ourselves just because it happens to be convenient. And the second thing to say is that 
the science is very clear that if you have steady reductions in methane, you can actually have a net positive effect on your mitigation. So, for example, if you had a 7 or 8% reduction in emissions from the energy sector in fossil CO2 and other gases, and uh, a lower target for methane, you would still end up possibly uh, meeting your 2050 target on schedule because of the different uh, way that methane behaves in the atmosphere. So if there's uh, anything to be learned from this, it's not that it's a get out free clause for agriculture. Methane does behave differently. We need to acknowledge that in how we develop our policies and our strategies. But with a view to meeting our obligations under the Paris Agreement and not with a view to creating any more loopholes uh, or flexibilities that lead to further environmental impacts. I've, I'm well, just gonna, you've got three or so minutes left. Perfect. So um, I've kind of said a lot of this already. Uh, essentially, what, what has been driving up emissions in the agricultural side um, is, well, I, what's driving emissions up is the removal of the milk quota in particular. Uh, the fact that uh, nitrogen is being applied excessively to increase grass growth, uh, which is facilitating the extra herd numbers and milk outputs. Any arguments about efficiency here? are irrelevant because it's the climatic impact and the environmental impact of the, the practices that we're interested in. If Irish farmers can produce food efficiently, that's wonderful. But when we think about efficiency, we have to be thinking about nutritional security, uh, food sovereignty and local resilience, as well as being able to make afford affordable food. So. The EPA acknowledged themselves and a number of statements over the last few years very boldly that our agricultural emissions are still projected to grow, that they're not on a trajectory of decline. And sometimes you hear from the agri sector that, oh, we have lower cattle numbers this year. And this is true. I checked it. But the cattle numbers on the dairy side are increasing and they're decreasing on the beef and suckler side. So. Another thing that comes up is, well, what about hedgerows and soils? Given that we have this complicated land use uh, relationship in the carbon cycle between removals and emissions, surely there's something we can be doing with our land to draw this carbon and methane back out of the atmosphere. Well, to cut it very simply, it's very difficult to verify that in practice. Uh, the most important thing we need to do is protect the hedgerows that we already have. And there's some evidence that these are being degraded at the moment and we're losing hedgerows rather than adding to the carbon store that's locked there. Um, it's very difficult to measure it. So if you had some sort of credit scheme based on hedgerow carbon, how would you implement that? I mean, just think of the practicalities. It'd be almost impossible. It'd be much better to reward farmers for other types of ecosystem services that can be verified and uh, justified. Um, the same goes on the soil side, because it's just impossible to measure it. You'd literally be measuring the carbon stored on a sort of field by field basis. And it makes more sense not to sort of reward credits, but to be rewarding activities. Uh, and I'm sure Una will address that in a lot more detail. There's also, in principle, an ethical issue with offsetting in the first place. It, 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 it sets up the wrong um, precedent. We should be doing any kind of offsetting as a form of additionality. It should be additional to the mitigation obligations we've already signed up to under the Paris Agreement. And we certainly shouldn't be trying to purchase indulgences or setting up offsetting schemes to just make the numbers right on the page, even though the environmental impacts might be deteriorating. So I have a couple of other points here just to make about uh, the relationship between you know, uh, pasture and uh, tillage and all of this kind of thing and debates about whether beef is more efficiently produced in Ireland and therefore we should be able to, to, to produce more of it than other countries. Maybe we'll come to those in questions. Um, <clears throat> but I'll just finish off with one slide about solutions. And this rather abstract looking graph is actually taken from one of my favourite reports, which is the Zero Carbon Britain report from the Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales. And they, instead of sort of taking this rather piecemeal incremental approach to climate policy that we have in Ireland, took it that they wanted to get the UK to zero emissions uh, by 2050. And they sort of worked backwards from that to see what implications that would have for all the different sectors. And it's very clear that it means a radical change in land use because we 
in a zero carbon world, you cannot devote so much land to growing feedstock for cattle. It's a very efficient, inefficient use of land. So you can have a look at this uh, lovely graph. It's very abstract, but it, it, it matches very well the kind of concept of, you know, using our land more productively to grow the food we need to be nutritionally and food secure rather than to be growing commodities that we're exporting at great environmental and social cost at home. So the solutions are going to involve reshaping our food system inevitably. Uh, we have to think uh, about food instead of commodities and we have to reduce emissions from fertilizers, manure storage and livestock which might mean and I think inevitably means a reduction in herd size now, whether that happens with the beef or the dairy herd uh, is something we'll discuss later. I haven't had time to get into that here. Um, but even if we introduce lots of efficiencies, and this is where Chagask are very good, they have lots of very prescriptive things to say about how farmers can do things in a more environmentally friendly way. The reality is that we, our model of agriculture needs to change and we're going to need to change as consumers as well. We're going to need to eat less meat, we're going to have to buy more locally food, uh, produced food and support local farmers and hopefully grow some of our own as well and essentially become more self-reliant in food and reducing the impact of our food production activities on other parts of the world. So I will leave it at that. I'm sorry, Anya, for going a bit over. That's all right. And we can come back to some of those points in the questions later. Thank you so much, Saif. Um, so what I just want to bring people's attention to is there is loads and loads of questions in the Q&A box. Um, so you can go into that Q&A box and you can upvote any questions you might find interesting. What I will ask you to do is have a quick glance through them to make sure that your question hasn't already been asked. If your question has already been asked, it's much easier for us if you can just give it a thumbs up so you can vote it up the list and make sure that it is asked. Um, I am now, uh, oh, and also another thing is please use the chat box. There's some really interesting conversations happening. We can already see people making connections, people asking about something and someone else saying, uh, here's a project that's already happening. So it's, it's great to use the chat box while you're on to make connections and to learn from each other. So now I'm going to introduce Una Duggan. Um, and Una is, uh, leads a team of advocates for birds, their habitats and other biodiversity at Birdwatch Ireland, where she's worked for over five years. Una's from a farming background in County Limerick. Um, she's three degrees, including a first class MSc in biodiversity and land use planning, and has an experience and skills gained over a 20 year career working for the environment through a range of entities, including businesses, governments and non-governmental organisations. So Una is going to talk to us about the links between agriculture and biodiversity in Ireland. Thanks, Una. Take it away. Uh, hi, everybody, and thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to tell you um, about um, biodiversity on our farmland um, and also the linkages with climate and how all of these are interconnected. And um, just to say from the outset that um, many of the things that um, Sai've already described, which are driving emissions, um, uh, increased emissions, are also driving. Um, biodiversity loss in agriculture. Um, I've got, I suppose, three main messages. Um, I suppose the first thing is that traditionally we have a, a very rich farmland biodiversity, but we have lost a lot of it. Um, I'll go through the reasons for this loss, and then I will leave you with some hope that we can save it um, with the right policies and supports. And I've been uh, almost 25 years in this game, and I tell you, if I didn't feel optimistic about being able to um, save our biodiversity, I, I just wouldn't be in it anymore. And I really do have faith that we can do that. So just a little bit about um, farmland um, biodiversity. You know, in, it's complex. In Ireland, uh, an awful lot of our biodiversity has evolved with grassland systems. And that would be um, semi-natural grasslands um, of our um, lowlands, like grasslands, um, coastal, beautiful macker grasslands, upland, um, heath grasslands, and a lot of our species have then um, evolved to, uh, they are supported by these habitats. That includes, um, like from the bottom up, from grasses and wildflowers and heathers um, to the insects that are, are supported there. 
um, and rise up the food chain then to um, birds and other, uh, other species. So we have had a very rich um, biodiversity. There's a lovely um, field of um, ragged robin in Leitrim and that really shows you that um, shows you this kind of a beautiful semi-natural grassland. And this is supported by low intensity and low input so there'd be no fertilizer on that field and then it supports these um, beautiful wildflowers. Um, Here's um, some of the, um, we call this high nature value farmland now because I suppose prior to the 70s, um, we all, it was all high nature value farmland because we had mixed farming that included livestock and some tillage. Um, and we had a, a, a very a thriving biodiversity. Um, now we call it high nature value farmland because um, it is, I suppose, it's, it's almost a niche in, in its own way. So in the top, fritillary butterfly. You'll see a hen, male hen harrier there in the middle. Um, there's red grouse which is an upland um, uh, bird species and um, curlew on the right. Um, there's skylark um, which is another um, bird species supported on um, semi-natural grassland, um, small white ort and the great yellow bumblebee on the right. So High nature value farming is what we want to see supported more and it is um, uh, it, it supports these species rich meadows um, and grasslands um, for lapwing and red shank um, and as I said um, coastal um, and macro habitats that include um, chuff and golden plover. So why do, how does this work? So basically the cattle go around and they eat, um, eat the grasses and create scattered taller tussocks for nesting. That's a very important factor for, for breeding waders. And they poach up the land and the trampling causes these muddy edges, for instance, for lapwing chicks. And there's a little lapwing chick so that they can eat the invertebrates then in the mud. Um, they also, the, the, what, where they support shallow pools and the cattle are, um, are, are, are moving around and trampling um, the areas where there's a This is where really, really important for, for breeding waders. And breeding waders are some of our species that are most, uh, most threatened. Um, so what is the essential feature in this? You see the um, open, um, open uh, landscape here with, uh, this is the Shannon Callows, um, where you see on the left, um, eggs of lapwing um, looking quite uh, quite vulnerable there um, in in a grassland in a grassland environment. But so that diversity, I suppose, that we're working to support, um, in particular for um, for breeding waders. Um, but here is now is is the I suppose um, the some of the stats. Um, Basically, we've lost an awful lot of our, our farmland biodiversity. So, from species such as the corncrake, curlew, the lapwing, barn owl, red shank, winch hat, and twice, um, going from the 1970s in the blue bars, you will see that um, uh, the orange bars are the 90s. You see the intensification and mechanization of farm machinery has really started to result in losses of, um, losses of um, species and populations. So we're looking at a pretty um, sad state of affairs now because when the last bird atlas was done in 2010, you'll see the grey bars show um, a significant, quite a significant loss. Um, and more stats than um, the most recent um, report that Ireland submitted to the European Commission showed that 85% of our EU protected habitats have bad or inadequate status. So these are supposed to be the best of the best and they're not the best of the best anymore. 70% of those though, however, are impacted negatively by agricultural practices. And that is quite a shocking finding. Um, but it must be also borne in mind, right, if the agriculture practices were, let's say, better, uh, less intensive, we would hope to see uh, a reversal of that trend. So that shows you the relationship 
um, that agriculture has with, with even our most our EU protected habitats. And not lot of those habitats are farmed habitats. Um, we've seen a loss of, this is shocking to me and makes me very sad because I love uh, lowland hay meadows, but we've lost 28% of our lowland hay meadows since 2013 due to intensification, which is a pretty shocking figure. Um, as many of you might already know, one third of our 99 wild bee species are threatened with extinction and are, are you know, need wildflowers um, to survive. And a lot of that would be down to loss of, uh, loss of, uh, of those semi-natural grasslands. Um, so, um, more of the reasons why this is happening. So, um, and I've mentioned the mechanization over time, but we, you know, the intensification has just increased, especially in the last um, in the last twenty years. Um, we've gone to from mixed farming to mainly beef and dairy. Um, the intensification has of uh, livestock production has moved to monocrop rye, perennial ryegrass production, um, which is has to be supported by drainage. Um, plowing, reseeding, field enlargement, um, increased fertilizer usage. Um, you know, I'm just giving you a three minute warning. Okay, thanks. We've seen burning in the uplands and inappropriate grazing on fragile uh, habitats there. Um, that's related to land eligibility rules through CAP. Um, we've seen a lot of hedgerow removal and inappropriate management and between 2011 and 20. Uh, 19, over 300 kilometers of hedgerows have been approved for removal by the Department of Agriculture. Um, and that, to me, is, is really shocking because then you're calling, people are calling for afforestation on these marginal habitats up in the Northwest, which is the most important for biodiversity. So, as, as I've said, why is this, you know, outlined that, you know, why is this happening? It's the same reasons why the, the, with the increase in greenhouse gas emissions is the policy drivers national policy on food waste 2025 um, coupled with the, the cap mechanism where not enough of that public money has been going to support public goods um, and there needs to be a, a shift in that next time round and we're in currently in cap negotiations at the moment um, here's just an example of um, some uh, like we've moved towards this much more intensive landscape and i want to show you that um you'll see these uh, yeah, the left and then you'll see all these uh these very intensive green fields and all these dots are where bird of Ireland put a, a, a tag a, a satellite a gps tracking device on on a barn owl um, that was found on a farm in near Formoy. and basically the the dots show how the barn owl is moving through the through the environment to hunt and to rest and basically it's following the line of hedgerows in the intensively farmed landscape but that just shows you how important hedgerows are for hunting for um, for food for this species, but also it shows that it's pretty much avoiding the um, the intensive fields because there's no forest. Um, so this was a, a, a good illustration of, of what's happening to some of our species that are hanging on and burn owl is hanging on. What can be done? Well, as I said, the same, uh, there's the, a lot of the same measures that Saif has already identified are important also for high nature, for, for supporting birds and high nature value farming. A move away from intensification is a must um, and diversification um, would be good. Um, but also biodiversity needs, like these species, like they need targeted measures. And we know what needs to be done and Bird Ireland has been working on this for many years, working with farmers, um, pr um, on projects such as the Curlew European Innovation Partnership Program um, on the Carob and here's a picture of some farmers looking at this uh, muddy kind of wet uh, uh, field and uh, being shown why this is important by our by one of my colleagues. Um, so more investment training and targeted results-based scheme through the Common Agricultural Policy would really help biodiversity. Um, we're talking about uh, of cap money to be ring fence for farmers to support nature. So this money is all going to farmers. We just want to, to support the farmers to do the right thing. Um, so here, not sure how well you can see that map, but here's a map of our high nature value farming um, uh, for, uh, farmland that was done by Chagask and quite a bit of our Western seaboard is high nature value, um, which needs to be ground truthed um, to make sure it is because not all of the beef farming is high nature value, but a lot of it is. 
and, and that is a, an important um, uh, thing to, to that I'll come back to um, about that we need we do need to continue with uh, uh, grazing in the right places. Um, specifically, like some of the responses from farmers from being involved in these results based approaches, is really positive feedback. Um, farmers um, said things like. Um, that the schemes like this can make them feel more conscious about positive environmental management. Um, that for farmers, producing higher quality environmental products uh, and being rewarded for those was really, really good. Um, it's really important to note, I, I think this must be stated, that no farmer goes out to destroy nature. I, I firmly believe that is not, that doesn't happen. Um, I think policies, I know that hedgerow removal happens in places and Farmers have, are at the pin of their collars with trying to um, make more money um, when they're getting not very strong prices for, for what they produce because we've gone towards a volume and commodity market and that's unfortunate. So um, in relation to um, farmland habitats, protecting and restoring those farmland I'm habitats. I'm just going to ask you, Una, just can you finish on this slide and we can come back to some of the rest in Q&A. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, gotcha. Okay, well, look, I'm just going to say that another thing we'd like to see is a minimum percent, 10% of all farmland must be dedicated to biodiversity. And I, yeah, I can go on a bit more about that in a minute. Grant, um, we will be publishing all, everyone's slides and hopefully some of the uh, questions will be, um, or the rest of the slides can be talked about in, um, the Q&A. But I want to quickly move on to our final panelist, Alva Gerard, who is actually a farmer. So we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, she's got diversified farm experience um, and she owns a farm called Brookfield Farm, which has an ethos based in regenerative farming, maintaining biodiversity, healthy food, craft production, which is all through community uh, support. Um, she uh, has many awards. Uh, she has an MSc in Sustainable Development and in the Environment from University College London and an MSc in Organic Farming from the Scottish Agricultural College. Um, she also um, delivers academic courses, including Level 6 Agriculture with Gertine Agricultural College and Level 7 and 8 BSc in Agriculture and Environment with LIT. So thank you so much for joining us, Alva. Do you want to share your screen there? We can have a look or just talk to us about what do you want to say? Sorry. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, we can see your slides. Perfect. Thanks. Off you go. Thank you very much for having me to speak. It's um, some really interesting discussions going on and some really good presentations before me. I have a lot to live up to. So, um, talking as a farmer and just sharing some of my experience and um, looking also at what contribution can agriculture make to climate action. So a little bit about, is the screen moving on? Um, yeah, is, can you see the second screen? Yeah, yeah we can, yeah. Great, so as, um, as has been described, I have an integrated and diverse farm and business and this is a picture of the landscape um, of the farm, looking down towards Loch Derrick, which, as Una has pointed out, is um, uh, an SAC, SPA. Um, so it is really important that the farming that's done around here um, doesn't pollute this very important landscape. Um, and as you can see, it's, um, there, are, there are mixed farms. There's um, tillage, there's sheep, there's cattle. And I do, I'll show you a little bit now about what I do myself. This in the foreground is um, one of my smaller woods, which is a broadleaf um, forest, which is um, native, broad, uh, native woodland as well. So it's not a very big farm. It's um, 30 hectares, of which 15 um, hectares was arable up till last year. Um, there's six hectares of broadleaf forestry and three hectares of native woodland, you just saw and six hectares of grass. So the farming is um, forestry, gloss flower, flower meadows that I use for, for doing flowers for bees as well. It's a sort of dual purpose. I sell lamb directly to customers and I do forage crops like hay and silage. And until 2019, we were doing um, about a, a third of the farm was arable. We, we grew things like barley, wheat, oilseed rape. So the farm business is diversified. We 
um, do beekeeping, honey, and an offer a thing called high share. So that if you are a interested in Irish bull honey and sharing in the food production, uh, we do a community supported agriculture where you can get a share of the hive and get a share of the honey and come to visit. Um, we also make handmade beeswax candles and run demonstrations, visitor experiences where you can taste honey, make beeswax candles, walk in flower meadows, um, think about biodiversity, see it in action. And I also teach a lecture in Gertin and abroad as well in, in agricultural topics like regenerative agriculture and um, technical agricultural topics like uh, farm business management. Okay. So I'm just having a quick look at my, my um, qualifications in farming. I've got an organic farming master's from Scotland and an MSc in sustainable development and environment. Um, also an MBA in project management for construction. But the important um, part of those qualifications is that um, it, it really gives me a, a little sense of equity. Um, the sustainable development and environment is about sharing um, the planet's resources uh, fairly. And at the moment, Ireland is occupying or using five to seven times our planetary resource equivalent. So for every hectare that we're, we're farming, we're actually using the world's resources about seven, seven times of that, which doesn't really seem fair. So we can see what we can do about that. Um, I've been lucky enough to pick up a number of awards, including um, Sustainable Farming and Living Award winner last year for the RDS. Um, we, we were due to run it again this year, but um, obviously that's been stopped by the, the COVID virus. Um, I'm a Farming for Nature honorary ambassador. I'm very, very proud of that. It's, it's come, came out of the Burren Life Project, showing farmers um, very positive uh, practices, and it's been a huge success. I'm also a Nuffield Agricultural Scholar, and my research is into how farmers can reach consumers directly, which is really important for helping with income, which is one of the big critical parts for rural life and for farmers, and how this impacts on climate is really important. And I also teach and lecture um, in Gertie Agricultural College. I also teach um, with IFL International, who are the umbrella group for agriculture, it, um, organic agriculture internationally. So recent activities, there's been quite a lot going on. Um, this on the right hand side, you can see my Farming for Nature ambassador and I'm also the, the award for um, the RDS. Um, so in order to have a diversified farm, you have to be busy around all the seasons. So um, and making a living from farming is, um, it's about being in a a successful farm in a thriving rural area and farms need to have options as far as I'm concerned selling directly to the consumer we need to add value we need to diversify I was listening to an interesting podcast this morning um, with the Irish Farmers Journal about sustainability and there was a New Zealand commentator saying that in New Zealand the big dairy farmers all the farmers are looking at diversifying that there's no single, that there was a big take home message for me, is that you cannot do one kind of farming. I don't know if you can hear there's a lamb outside shouting, it's, it's lost its mother. Um, I'll have to go and give it a hand in a minute. So, um, so the key to rural sustainability is about a range of farm types and diversification models. And my research and work has been a lot about looking at what models are going to work in the Irish context. And a lot of it is about resilient farms in terms of income, in terms of not impacting on the environment. Um, you need to look at um, having a lot of different income streams. So I, have, I think it's actually great that farmers in a lot of areas of Ireland are um, or have another income stream coming from something else. Um, that really helps with, um, with, with rural diversity and in, 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 in rural sustainability generally. And if you just look at the right hand side of the screen for this was published in November, 2019, this is the Chagusk farm income. Um, that cattle rearing and sheep rearing and, and tillage as well 
it's not making a huge amount of money. That's 13,000, um, just under 14,000 income for sheep farmers and 9,000 for um, sector cattle uh, farms. Um, dairy is doing slightly better, but dairy farming is taking on a huge amount of debt and it's, it's quite unresilient in many ways. And this is the point that the New Zealand commentator was making that um, dairy in New Zealand, and we're following New Zealand a lot, dairy um, is needing to look at diversifying. So let's have a look. I'm just going to give you a three minute warning there, Alva. Thank you. So the role of education is, I think it's really important because I, I teach agriculture as well as practicing, uh, being a practicing farmer. Um, what role can training and education have? Um, I think it's the really important things that gives farmers a much better understanding of what surrounds them. I've met farmers um, and there's this claim that farmers are the custodians of the environment. You cannot be the custodian of your environment if you don't know what you're looking at and if you're not being trained. The Irish ed educational system for agriculture has got to include some environmental teaching because I've met farmers who don't know the difference between a hazel tree and an ash tree. They can't identify when they're looking at a large bird of prey, whether it's a hawk, a buzzard or a sea eagle. And they have absolutely no idea of how to assess what is actually on their farm. So if they don't know what's on their farm, so they don't know what's around them, how can they be protecting it and being the custodian? Um, but education is really important because the more the farmers know about what is on their land, the more interested they are and they've become more and more fascinated. And it really does motivate farmers to change their practices. And a really good example is the Brian Life Project or the Bride Valley Project, which is about um, dairy farming. Um, so that is basically basically it. I'm, I'm here for questions. Um, there's uh, me in my beekeeping uh, costume, not heading off to, to Mars in a spacesuit. Um, I'm active on a lot of social media. I've got a website and YouTube, and there's a lovely little YouTube uh, video on the bottom um, right hand side. You can see um, if you click into Brookfield.farm, which actually gives a 360 degree picture of the farm. Since you can't go there at the moment, you're very welcome to go and have a look um, and have a look around the farm. And when we open again, we'd love to have you to, to visit. Thanks for that. Thanks so much, Alva. So, um, again, great conversations happening over in the chat box. Please continue them. But we're now, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Catherine, who is going to moderate the Q&A. Um, and we've been busily um, categorizing, looking at all your questions. And thanks so much for the upvoting. It's been really helpful. Um, so, Catherine, take it away. Good evening, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, thank you so much uh, to our three panelists. Thanks, Anya. And thank you all for uh, the questions. I have 41 questions in my Q&A box. And so unfortunately, we won't get a chance to answer all of them. But what we, we have been doing, Anya and myself behind the scenes, is uh, looking at all the ones that have got lots of votes and support and then grouping them. Um, and obviously, this is all very subjective. But um, what I have here in terms of the questions um, uh, is uh, looking at, well, like, questions around policy integration and coherence around climate and biodiversity and willingness to change, uh, the impact of a policy shift or a farming shift on incomes and farm incomes. Some quest lots of questions around food security and then some questions on solutions uh, and how to move forward. So I think what we'll do is uh, I'll take some of the main questions from those categories, put them to our panelists and um, and we'll take it from there. Just, just before you start, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in specifically for Alva, and we may not be able to get to those. So what we might do is we'll put them to Alva, and when we send that recording of the webinar, maybe Alva will give us um, a few answers to those questions um, specifically. Thanks, Sonia. Right. Um, so, so one of our top questions actually is around uh, the role of woodlands, forestry, um, and agroforestry and how all of that integrates uh, within the current uh, policy context. Um, so how, how do we strategically integrate woodlands, forestry, agroforestry into to normal agriculture? Uh, why is quilture permitted to uh, continue growing conifers? What percentage of native woodlands should we have in Ireland? 
Um, and um, a question that I have specifically for Una then is, uh, why is Una against agroforestry on high uh, nature value farmland? So I'm going to put that question um, to our panelists. Um, I decide if you'd like to address anything. I know you mentioned uh, the role of forestry um, and woodlands in your uh, presentation. And then um, we can put it to Una and Alba as well. Um, I'll be very brief. I'm not an expert on forestry at all, um, but the, the, the forestry model that we have been following in Ireland has, even by its own terms, not been very successful because the plan is to plant, I think, 8,000 hectares per annum and we've been failing to meet that target. So I think at the moment, if just working from memory, we are able to claim in our inventories that forestry captures 4 million tonnes or so per annum. But of course, if we chop those trees down in maybe five or ten years time that saving is gone again and there's also a separate category in the inventory for um, wood products that are um, harvested but where the carbon is still stored for example if you chop trees down for construction timber and furniture and things like that the you, you know that, that's measured separately uh, the main point here is that we're not planting the trees in the right places Forestry is unpopular with communities and with farmers, even where there is financial incentives to engage in forestry grants and that kind of thing. Um, the difficulty is that from a climate point of view, we are not utilising this potential of forestry in terms of drawing down carbon. But in order for that to work, we need to be willing to leave the trees there. So the kind of short term forestry, commercial forestry model that we have been applying won't really do anything for us in a, in a climate sense. So we need to think about trees as stores of carbon and that's separately from all the other benefits in biodiversity and all the species that can be supported by woodland habitats. Um, how that works with agriculture, that's best left for the other two panelists to address. Una, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I just, um, I saw that comment, why does Una hate agroforestry and HMV farmland? And I was in the middle of typing a response and um, uh, when uh, you called out the question and that was great, Captain, thanks. Um, so um, basically the issue with um, forestry or agroforestry, including agroforestry in high nature value farmland is that it pretty much will, is a new habitat, new, let's say, activity on high nature value farmlands that is already biodiversity rich and it will exterminate what is already there. So if you've got um, like a species rich grassland filled with orchids and you plant a woodland or a forest it with citrus spruce, whichever, then all of that high nature value species orchid rich grassland is gone. That was important for marsh fertility and a range of wild native grasses and wildflowers and uh, the whole food chain then. So it's really detrimental loss um, for the biodiversity that's already existing there. So um, at Birdwatch Ireland, our mantra is the right trees in the right place with the right management. I mean, we have to, we, um, we absolutely want to see more woodlands, but please just not on areas that are already supporting ground nesting birds and, and, and butterflies and all these other species. So the thing is as well with trees that they hide predators like crows and foxes. And I love crows myself, but um, they will eat the eggs and chicks of already threatened species. So um, it's, it's really important that we don't put them in on those important areas where, where biodiversity exists already. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Just to add, Go ahead. Just to, add to what Una says, um, she's absolutely right, the right tree in the right place. Um, and it is all about knowing what you have on your land. So you, you choose correctly and wisely what to put and where. But I'm, I'm uh, very, very keen on the right tree in the right place and I think it can really help um, animal welfare it can help um, there's a lot of work being done on browsing for animal agriculture so browsing um, willow and ash and what it can what it can add to the diet it's um, something that that you know that is really worth looking at and tree, more trees properly placed in on farms can really help with biodiversity as well as long as you know what you're doing but I totally take that 
the UNA is, is yeah, much more of an expert on that than many people. Great, thank you. Could I just come back in and make one observation, which I didn't make maybe as clearly as, as I could have. It's very likely that the programme for government will see an increased uh, target for forestry as a way of meeting that 7% target. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to be confronting some difficult choices about land use. And I notice, and I don't know what state this is at at the moment, but the, the Green Party, in its uh, contribution and its questions to Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael was looking for them to support the idea of a national land use plan. And I think that will be very, very important because we need to be very clear about what our policy is, about where these trees are appropriate to plant. Um, we are going to have to plant more trees there is going to have to be more forestry. Um, we also aren't producing enough timber for our uh, construction uses and we need to get away from using cement and so on and so forth. So there's, we need more timber, we need more biomass and we need more carbon storage. And that's looking at it in a very, very narrow way as you know, opposed to all the other aspects. So, so it's very, very important that we have a comprehensive, coherent approach to land use that uh, meets the kind of concerns that, that Una is raising, that uh, provides farmers with incomes and incentives, and also that motivational piece in training and education as well, so that they can, um, you know, get engaged with, with something that currently isn't uh, very appealing to them. Excellent. Yeah, can, I just, can I just add on that, like, you know, farming for nature is also an ecosystem service that can be provided by land use. It can be carbon on upland blanket bogs. It can be planting woodland on, put it on intensive dairy farms, please. There we go. That would be a great spot for more woodland. But it's important to realize that we aren't also in a biodiversity crisis that was declared last year. We're losing our species in Ireland. And, we, and that coherence is absolutely right, so We really do need to have that. So we don't have a diversity problem and a climate problem. Perfect. And just to move on, because I'm aware of, of quite a, a few really interesting and popular questions around food security. And I'm sure you're all aware that the IPCC report that came out last August on land use and climate change highlighted the challenges of mitigating from land use, uh, land use playing a role in terms of carbon sequestration, but then land use also being vital for actually growing food and the challenges that those three dynamics um, present uh, in terms of policy. So um, I, I think this then flows on quite nicely to these questions uh, to go from talking about forestry and planting uh, and that element of land use policy to actually the food security question. So uh, I have some of the questions that I've grouped here, but questions specifically for Sai, but it's open to all the panel, of course. I think it's a very good question. And I know that, uh, you know, New Zealand came up in, in some of the, the presentations. And this question is, um, you know, are there any counties or even countries or local initiatives that are doing particularly well in terms of food sovereignty, food resilience, local resilience, um, and, and what is it about uh, these, these initiatives or these examples uh, that, that means that they're doing quite well. And just to add on to that then, you know, in terms of looking at Ireland, how feasible would it be for Ireland to be, to be food secure by actually growing its own food? And I suppose that the, the current COVID crisis is showing how important the food security question really is. Um, and then just to add to that, um, you know, in, in terms of meeting those food security challenges, um, do the panel have an opinion on the percentage of the population that should ideally be actually involved directly in agriculture in terms of food production and preparation? So a number of really good questions there if you want to. Sai, if you want to start. There was a yeah, trip. I'm not sure that I'm the best person to answer that. So I, I, um, I was looking through the chat box and so many of you that are participating in this know so much more about growing food than I do. Um, I'm a boring policy one who gets a box delivery. Um, but it, it, it's true to say that those kind of schemes have grown in popularity in recent weeks. And there's nothing like a, the, the, the crisis of this uh, strange lockdown experience to make us aware of how dependent we are on these complex and long supply chains and how, how utterly we dependent we are on supermarkets for our food. Um, so a lot of people are, have, have been, you know, coming around for whatever reason, because they have a little more time or whatever, uh, to the idea of growing their own food. But in a policy sense, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot in that question, actually, because um, the schemes that are uh, in place, like, for instance, we have a very low 
uh, uptake of organic or agriculture in Ireland. It's very low. Elva will be able to tell us more of that than I can, but I think it's only one or two percent of our land area, whereas uh, Austria, for example, has something like 25 or 30 percent of its land uh, under organic agriculture. Um, and that tends to, in itself, foster more diversification, more woodlands integrated into agricultural practice. So the, the other thing is community supported agriculture. So this is an approach where communities uh, organize a kind of co-op arrangement with, with, with food producers, farmers who may not even be located in the same area. And it's a kind of a way of bypassing those supply chains. There is a local uh, growing groups. There's a lot of things happening around the country and I'm quite sure the others know more about this than me, but just in terms of pointing to the, the policy piece, um, which is where I, I tend to get interested, it comes down to pricing. Because unfortunately, as long as we are used to paying for cheap food that's wrapped up in plastic and we, uh, in supermarkets, and if we think that that's where food comes from, we will find it very expensive to be going to the box delivery, the local food producer, the, the uh, community supported agriculture schemes. We need to educate ourselves about the true cost of food production and how uh, the cost is actually being borne by the environment as a result of us not paying the true cost and also we're not even delivering reasonable incomes to farmers. So we need to be prepared to pay more for food and we need to uh, change our expectations around packaging and appearances and all of that and eating seasonally uh, and of course the big thing which did come up in the chat earlier is eating less uh, meat animal products um, and um, you know, we're exporting all this animal protein, but in fact, we're, not, we're nutritionally poor as a nation. We import more food than we export in terms of our own consumption. We import about 80% of our fruit and vegetables, and that's a terrible shame. And just, I'll finish with one little interesting um, anecdote that somebody told me about today. So when you look at the amount of land in Ireland under tillage, since the famine, it's been in steady decline except for two periods. And those two periods were World War I and World War II, which is kind of interesting. So it was the shock of a food security shock, if you like, that made people realize they had to grow their own food because it was supply problems and imports from the UK were obviously difficult and expensive at the time. Food was probably very expensive during those years as well. So people were incentivized to grow their own as much as possible. But as soon as the emergency passed, uh, we started exporting. We, we moved into the livestock production and exports and we started re-importing the fruit and veg. And it's just a shame. I mean, you just have to wonder why, why we're doing what we're doing, because it doesn't make a lot of sense not to be able to uh, produce the food that we need to be nutritionally secure. Alvi, you talked a lot about diversification. So do you want to add to, to what I've said from that diversification, like that you're, you're on the ground practicing this and what that means then for food security and some of the questions that were raised? Absolutely. It's something I've been very concerned about for um, really a number of years now. I mean, I know that we have lost 75% um, of our horticulturists, growers in Ireland um, over the past 15 years. It's a huge loss. So. And so, as I've said, we're importing 80% of our fruit and vegetables, which is extraordinary. In, in, in a country that claims to feed the world, um, we are not producing enough potatoes to feed ourselves and enough carrots um, and enough apples. And these are you know, these, all the crops we can, we can grow here. Um, we really should be doing more. And in fact, um, on a personal note, when the, when the news of this um, virus crisis came out, I straight away, I'd had a little domestic um, vegetable garden, and but I've gone <laughs> bigger. I've got nearly two thirds of an acre of vegetables in now. In March, I just turned some grassland into, into potatoes, artichokes, beans, peas. Um, so I just thought, well, we might have quite a serious problem coming up with food sovereignty and importing of food because most of our fruit and vegetable as it comes from the UK are through the UK from other places like the Netherlands. So um, this is not just me uh, anecdotally and, and there's newspaper articles about this across the whole of Ireland. People are desperately trying to grow vegetables. They, 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 they get that. That could be a big problem. And it's also in diversification sense it's, it's better for a farmer in the 80s when I was a, a kid in Tipperary where I'm farming now 
pretty much all the farmers had a little strip out the back where they where they grew potatoes and carrots and onions and you know a bit to not necessarily feed the entire family but certainly to make quite a good contribution there's absolutely no reason why we can't go back to that and i would highly suggest that i would suggest that we really do um we grow quite a lot that's excellent. and i might actually just stick with you because uh there is a direct question to you about farm income so would your farm income be enough to live on to support your family uh, without off farm work which many farmers have to do ireland is a high proportion of part-time farmers uh, and then related to that another question if we extensify ag agriculture uh, what would be the negative effect on employment in agribusinesses across rural areas so it's that that question around you know if there is a shift in land use um, what will be the economic consequences of that? Okay, um, there's, some, the, there's some very good questions there. First of all, um, what I do on my farm, I see everything as being related to farming. So my, what you might call my off-farm income, which is the teaching and consultancy, um, it's, all, it's all based in farming. It's all based around food production in a wider sense. So I don't see why farmers um, need to feel that there's such a division between on and off farm income. It's all contributing to a, a rural household. Um, and there, there can be a bit of a, a sort of, oh, you're a part-time farmer about, about this. But I think it's actually, it's actually really positive. It's a really good thing that farmers are getting diverse streams of income. And whether they're doing it from adding value to their, their farm product, like me with the honey, or dairy farmers making cheese, or um, people growing vegetables and selling directly through a, a community supported agriculture scheme. Whether they're doing that or whether they have um, a job in the county council, I don't think it really matters to, to, rural, to, to rural life, or it really matters to the household. Well, obviously, the income matters. To the, the income is very important, and of course, it matters to the family. Um, but I wouldn't be making that distinction. And the second question, can you just remind me what it was about? It, it's related, I suppose, so that if we have, I suppose, the, the widespread extensification of agriculture in Ireland, uh, you know, what would be the consequences in terms of employment um, in agribusiness and, and, and the rural economy? And I suppose we hear a lot about this in terms of that urban-rural uh -huh. divide that's often put out there. Um, well, so it's that question. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's a really interesting question. I think um, a lot of farms and a lot of farmers' lives would be much more positive if they had more labour on farm rather than less. Um, and what I, part of what I do on my farm is I look at myself as being a conduit for um, bringing in <laughs> EU and, and national money into the area by, through applying for grants and, um, and, and getting them. So I've, I've done sort of 30,000 euro worth of um, stone wall rebuilding, which is a traditional craft, getting a, a new grant. So that money has gone into my, my community, um, upskilling people and, and the grants we paid out for, for labor. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I have people coming in to do forestry work. Uh, I have people doing all sorts of, of like different projects. So more labour, definitely. And the more diverse a farm is, the more labour is, is going to be needed. The more you're doing uh, value added to farm produce, is what we really should be doing more of. That's more people involved. So that could be somebody's daughter or somebody's cousin doing um, baking bread. It could be making beer from the barley. It could be, you know, it's a whole range of stuff that could be adding um, to the household income in all sorts of ways. Um, so yeah more more labor great bring it on fewer fewer machines that cost um 450,000 which is what comes combine harvesters can cost that's a lot of money but we can pay a lot of people um to you know if you had if you put that money into into another way of farming so potentially yeah that's excellent thank you and i i just see that there was a question that there was a point made in the q a around a universal basic income and a changed subsidy arrangement uh, for farmers linked to uh, what they, the, what's here is a carbon neutral policy goes. And um, so that, that um, a change in, in, in how 
farmers are incentivized, I suppose. And that kind of brings us on to some of the questions around solutions that we have. And I really like this question. I think a lot of you uh, viewers really liked it as well. Um, I'm conscious of time as well, so we, we're, we'll keep an eye on the clock. Um, if you had, if you only had five years in government, which are the policies that would have the most persistent impact? Grants and taxes um, can be easily reversed, but how to lock in reductions? A climate law, which is something that we here in Stop Climate Chaos have been advocating for, or something else? Um, so quite a good uh, general question, but I think important as well. Um, Una, do you want to start off with that? Yeah, wow. If I was in government, what would I do? Oh my God. Um, if I had a load of money, of course. Um, so basically, I would be investing a significant amount of money in restoration, like peatland restoration, um, semi natural grassland restoration, um, supporting farmers to uh, farm for biodiversity and where. Uh, and Know, getting premium prices then for for their product which would be more extensive so not uh, you know really kind of marketed um, as a premium I, I guess and that would kind of line up with our you know the need to kind of cut down on on meat and and dairy um, so and on a positive note with that like yesterday the farm to fork strategy was published by the um, uh, European Commission and the biodiversity strategy we still have to be um, uh, uh, endorsed by government uh, leaders and when that time comes folks um, I, I will be putting out the call for emails to be going to, to all the political the leaders in, in nationally to, to make sure that Ireland endorses these strategies because they could be a game changer for agriculture and biodiversity so um, but in that strategy there they've got um, a, a target of a legally binding target proposal for um, habitat restoration um, as well as 50% cut in um, pesticide use, 20% um, uh, safeguarding, 30% um, of land for um, biodiversity. So these are really important things. That's, that's my answer anyway, what I would do. Is Excellent. That's great. And Sive, and I'm just, again, I'm really conscious of time and, and uh, I know we're talking about kind of about solutions and someone here has mentioned uh, Irish seaweed uh, as, as a, a, a solution and this is, is something we've been hearing a little bit about in the media, I think, last year. And then biogas. Um, so Sive, you know, if you were in government and, and if you had choices around policy, would you be thinking about Irish seaweed? Where would biogas um, production, would it play any kind of production in terms of addressing the, um, the, the methane problem in, in the sector? Okay, well, I think just to, to, to answer the first question, the first thing we must do is to stop making things worse. And that means we must keep the carbon that's already stored in the, in the soil, in the peat bogs and in the trees there. We mustn't take it away, we mustn't burn it, we mustn't drain it. So that means, it sounds simple, we have to stop as uh, Una was saying, and this means like today, as soon as possible, all peat extraction, uh, the border mona bogs, and then the horticultural peat. Um, so they're counted for differently in the greenhouse gas inventories, but obviously there's a huge amount of destruction. And once the bogs are drained, there's an ongoing leak of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere indefinitely. So we need to re-wet them, we need to restore them, and we need to leave them alone. Now, the other part of that piece is leaving the organic peaty soils alone and protecting them. And this is more complex because there is a lot of agricultural use of that land, which is not really appropriate for the kind of grazing activities or the grasslands that are there. We're losing carbon that's already locked in the soil because of what we're doing. So the first thing we must do is stop that. And um, we should be thinking about reforming our agriculture, our forestry model quite dramatically because that's another very important source of carbon and source of sequestration and removal. So uh, one of the lovely recommendations that was in the Joint Oireachtas Committee report that came from Andrew St. Ledger, who's uh, one, in one of the environmental NGOs involved with the environmental pillar and also with Stop Climate Chaos, was that every farm should be encouraged to have trees on it. 
So they don't have to be productive. We could have uh, grants to support tree planting, small copses of trees on you know, small parts of land that's like, you know, not being used for anything particularly. I agree completely with Una and especially living in the southeast myself, we need to concentrate some of the changes we're looking for in the areas where there's excessive nitrogen being used to promote dairy intensification. So the part of the country that Elva and I are in and in Cork as well, we need to sort of see measures to cap the use of nitrogen and to stop the further expansion of the dairy herd and to actively use those caps to uh, if you like, require a reduction in herd size. So if we reduce the amount of nitrogen going on the ground, we reduce water pollution, we reduce emissions, and we reduce the kind of interference with the grassland habitats that Una is describing. So those kind of interventions can be done in different ways, but it's very important that we tackle them in a way that's sending the right price signal that is enforceable, and that farmers understand exactly what they have to do because sometimes they do get very mixed messages. You know, it's a very complex area in practice. I would also reform Chagask and make sure that their function is to support sustainable agricultural practices. There's too many agricultural agribusiness interests involved in Chagask, unfortunately. And so therefore the expertise that's available to farmers is encouraging them towards this intensification model. Um, you asked me about seaweed and I did want to answer that. We have about six and a half million head of cattle in Ireland and we simply can't produce enough of that dried seaweed to deal with the methane emissions from each individual cow. So it's, it's a practical solution on a very small scale because it does work apparently, but it doesn't at scale. So at scale, the only solution is to reduce the herd and to diversify. And we, we need to be just clear about that message. Reducing the herd went from six and a half million cows does not mean that you look out your window and there'll be no cows in Ireland. It means reducing it. You know, you wouldn't even notice the reduction in terms of the, the visual landscape that we associate with the uh, Irish agriculture. Excellent, so I've, I, I'm, I'm quite conscious that we want to finish at around 6.30, so uh, um, Elva, I'm going to give you a minute <laughs> to address your five years in government uh, question <laughs> uh, from, from, from our um, on the ground perspective. Um, there's a, I think we really need to, um, to use our policy to assist um, um, regenerative farming, organic farming, um, because it solves quite a lot of the climate and biodiversity problems, not all of them, but quite a lot of them. Um, we need to look to our soil health and we need to, if, if I were in charge, I'd be putting in a soils directive that they didn't get through the, the way the, the EU water directive did, because it's absolutely critical that we are not degrading our soils any further. Um, I would have policies to assist farms to diversify, because I think it's, it's, it's a really important way to to go for economic and environmental resilience. And, um, but something that's very close to my heart is um, farmers reaching consumers directly in, other, in various ways, not just um, farm schemes, like farm box schemes. And um, South Korea, for instance, have, has this amazing system where it's a, a food co-op, which is owned by the farmers, processors, and they own the, the shops too. So, so the, in the centre of Seoul, which is a massive city, millions of people can go in and you can buy produce directly from the farmers and 80% of the, the shelf price goes back to the farmers um, and it's feeding millions of people and it's hugely successful and, um, and they, they're using ecological methods, quite often organic, to grow the food um, and they only sell Korean produced products so they don't sell sugar because you can't grow it there but they sell tofu and they sell all the stuff that, that Koreans love. And it's a huge success as it turns over millions and millions and millions a year. It's big business. It feeds a lot of people. It helps a lot of farmers um, and it is doing the right thing. There's absolutely no reason for us to have this kind of system that we have, which is dominated by big retailers and big meat processors. We don't have to do that. There's other ways. Um, and it's all, it, there's a lot of it in my, in my Nuffield report, looking which went around the world, looking at things like this, that we could change the food system. And we also need to change how farmers are being educated. It's a really important, really important part of this is, mm -hmm. about, um, is how farmers um, want to do their best in many ways, are prevented in many ways by the kind of policies that are in place. We can change those policies. They don't have to sell everything at the farm gate. 
to enormous processes who are getting all the profit. We don't have to have it like that. We can have it differently. That's it. Excellent. Um, and thank you so much to all of our three panellists. Um, just to say that um, uh, this is Stop Climate Chaos. We have 33 members um, from all over the country and uh, we're part of the One Future uh, People's Campaign for um, Faster and Fairer um, Climate Action, so I've mentioned during our, um, our presentation. But a number of our individual organisations do work um, more on agriculture and land use issues. So obviously Una is here from Birdwatch. Birdwatch is one of our um, organisations and then of course Antashka uh, with the Good Energies Alliance, they're based in Neitrim. Um, and then some of the, the development organisations that are part of our coalition, so Trocra, um, look at issues around um, food security, um, trade issues, uh, particularly with a focus on developing countries um, and concern. Um, and my apologies if, if I'm missing some of our, our members that do um, excellent work on, on land use as well, but just to point that out. Um, so thank you all. I'm now, and I'm, uh, my sincere apologies, I realise we do have a lot of questions that we didn't get time to answer, but it, I think it just shows how important this topic is, um, particularly going forward uh, in terms of Ireland's um, position on um, climate action. I'm going to hand over to on, uh, Anya for a final wrap up. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you so much to all our panellists um, and thanks to Catherine for moderating that Q&A. Um, I just wanted to mention one more uh, thing. Um, for young people who are interested in food sovereignty, uh, Friends of the Earth actually have a group called Growing Together, which is of small activists who work under 30s who work on food sovereignty in Ireland. So if you know any under 30s or if you're under 30 yourself, it's a nice group to get involved in. And um, you can find it, all the details on the Friends of the Earth website. And they have lots of events on tomorrow actually about food sovereignty. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to all our panelists. Um, as we said at the start, this was just the start of a discussion. We had over um, we had almost 80 questions so obviously it's hard to get to every question um, um, but what's been really amazing is all the contributions in the chat and I think that's what makes these webinars so rich in, is that like we have policy experts here who are talking but we also have people who have on the ground experience um, and other types of experience in the chat box having these conversations so thank you so much for that. Um, we will be putting this webinar up so you can share it and hopefully we can continue uh, this conversation into the future. So this was a starting point for this discussion. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming um, and we will be holding more of these over the next few weeks. So keep an eye on your emails. Goodbye. Thanks everybody, bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks for Thanks coming everybody, everyone. bye. Bye.